Right, thank you for coming to Aid with Friend Investor Events. Um, just to give a little oversight, we're going to go through a presentation and a QA and a will be happening afterwards. So just hold your question towards then. Um, now, further ado, can I introduce Richard Walinski, Finance Director of Ovation PLC. Right. Thanks very much, everybody, for coming and thanks for your time this afternoon. Um, what, the, what I'd like to talk about uh, this afternoon is just introduce you to Ovation and its business model. I'll quickly run through its most recent set of financial results. And then I'll, what I want to spend the majority of the talk about is actually what, what the reasons are to invest in the company today. And the short answer to that question is, is that it's a growth company. The history of this company over the 13 years of its operations is that it doubles in size every three years. That means it um, doubles the, the size of the, the fleet, doubles the revenue, and the, and the share prices followed that. Uh, what Ovation uh, uh, PLC is, is an aircraft lessor. So that means we buy commercial passenger aircraft and we lease them to airlines. The business model is very similar to buying uh, a flat to let. So we go and look for the best asset that we can, in, you know, you'd look for the best flat that you can, and then typically you'll use bank debt to fund up to 80% of the purchase of that, of that aircraft or that flat. So very similar, you understand that business model, very similar uh, 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 business model to that. Where the analogy breaks down is this. An aircraft will generate a yield of about 12% per year on, on the asset. That is a $100 million aircraft will generate you $12 million a year in rent. Or, or most typically, the most typical aircraft you can buy, which are what Ryanair and EasyJet use, they're about $50 million each. I'm talking about the Boeing 737s and the Airbus A320 family aircraft. So that $50 million aircraft will generate you about $6 million a year rent. And the other thing where it's different to the flat to let analogy is this, is that an airline will happily sign a lease for 20, 10 or 12 years at, a fixed, at that fixed uh, yield. So that'd be $6 million a year for 10 years. Now, if you do the maths very simply, an aircraft will pay itself off in the first lease. You know, if you rent a plane 12% a year for 12 years, you're getting back 144% of, of what that plane cost. And that's more than enough to amortise all the debt associated with that aircraft down to zero. So you own that aircraft outright. An aircraft lived for about 25 years. So they've got another you know, 10, 12, 15 years to run to generate you revenue. So it's a very lucrative, very... Um, um, uh, uh, huge profits generated in this business. So the overview of Ovation is that we're based in Singapore. So the uh, Singapore government give us a, a advantageous corporate tax rate of 8% and withholding tax exemption. Uh, we're listed on the London Stock Exchange, so it's not an AIM listed company. We've been uh, in operation for 13 years. The stock was initially listed at 4p, and I think this morning was trading at £2.93, and that's its 13-year share price history. And one of the things I hope to explain to you in the course of the next sort of 25 minutes is the, the, the most common response I get from investors today is, you know, why should I be buying Ovation shares at, at pretty much the top of where they've been in their 13-year history? Because we're trading almost at the, at the high end of our range. And that is because of the growth that's coming forward. So that'll be the key message in the second half because the, we think that the buying signal for investors is when we buy planes. And those planes obviously take a year to generate revenue. And I'll explain that in a little bit more detail. So right now where we sit, you'll, this um, presentation is at 1 May. We're a couple of weeks into May now. And so the portfolio actually is 45 aircraft because we delivered an aircraft a couple of weeks ago in May. And w those aircraft have a weighted average age of 3.6 years old. And on average, over the whole fleet, they've got 7.6 years to run on their, so on their leases, which is enormous visibility into the future of, of, of earnings. So the revenue that we're getting today is contracted to go for another 7.6 years. So if we do nothing, Today, we get the same sort of revenue for the next 7.6 years. But of course, we're going to grow significantly. We have now increased customers to 17 different airlines in 13 countries, and that's more than doubled in the past three years. And of course, the biggest risk in aircraft leasing 
is that the airline you're leasing the, the plane to goes bankrupt because airlines do go bankrupt. And so you want a diversified set of customers spread out through various jurisdictions and geographies around the world to minimise and mitigate that risk so that if one airline goes bad, it only represents a small proportion of your revenue. Of course, the key uh, risk mitigant to that in our, in our business model is this. We only like to buy brand new or very young aircraft and put them on long leases. We think that's the low end risk, the low risk end of the scale in that very young or brand new aircraft have got their whole lives to generate income for, for the company. And so we see ourselves as bespoke investors in this business. So our job is a lot like your job as investors and you look at a number of different shares. Well, we look at hundreds of planes a year and we're able to, and we look, we, when we consider an investment, we look at the type of plane, the credit of the airline, the, obviously the rent they're paying, how long they're going to pay the rent for. We look at the, the seat configuration, the engine type. All of those things go into make up uh, the, the risk um, criteria that we use to invest in a plane. And we'll rank planes and value them differently. And so while we might look at hundreds of planes a year, we might bid on 50, but we, to grow at the 30 plus percent a year that we've been growing at, we only need to end up buying seven or eight planes a year. And that is the simple reason why this company is able to grow so, uh, being able to grow so easily in that you've got to understand in our business that Boeing and Airbus, who represent 99% of the manufacture of all commercial passenger aircraft, make between 1,700 and 1,800 brand new planes a year. And they're worth $200 billion. We're a company that sits here today with under a billion and a half dollars worth of stuff, of, of, of aircraft. And of course, on top of those 17 or 1,800 new aircraft, there are five or 600 planes that are sold secondhand, either by, from airlines to lessors like us, or from other bigger lessors to smaller lessors like ourselves. So we've got you know, more than a couple of thousand opportunities to invest a year to end up with only buying seven or eight planes a year. So it's a huge supply of investment potential and that's what keeps our growth rate. Um, that's what is why the growth opportunity is so large and ongoing. Um, we've, the airlines are spread out throughout the, uh, the, um, throughout the globe. We list, we've been listed on the LSE for nine years. Um, we also issue high yield bonds um, uh, to, uh, to finance the plane alongside the mortgage debt that we've got. And the way that it works out is that two thirds of our debt is senior amortising mortgage debt and a third of our debt is the other high yield bonds. Um, they're publicly traded, their coupon is 6.5%. Um, but we've got to remember that that's in the scope of um, um, uh, our average cost of debt, which is four, last reported was 4.9%, and that's coming down. So if you do the simple maths on our business, we're getting 12% on the assets and a cost of debt of 4.9%. So there's a net interest margin of um, over 7% there. And what we're trying to do as we evolve the business and grow the business, and what we've been successfully doing over, you know, certainly over the last half dozen years, is lowering our cost of debt each year. And as we lower our cost of debt, we're able to compete with the bigger um, lessors in our business. Because they're all investment grade, they have much bigger balance sheets, they can issue debt at 3.5%. And so thereafter, the business, thereafter, the deals that look like you know, 20 brand new planes to British Airways or EasyJet or Ryanair. We're not competing in that space. As I said, we're bespoke investors. We're looking at the other 2,000 opportunities around the world for one and two plane deals. And that's been enough to um, drive our growth at the, at the growth rates that we've been achieving um, in the, since the beginning of the company's history. But as we evolve the company and lower our costs of debt in the future, we'll be able to compete more with, the big, with those bigger lessors on price and that enhances our growth opportunity in the future. So we've got a credit rating, which are, and we've had credit rating upgrades in the past year. We're rated double B minus with Fitch, and we're a B plus with S&P. We're led by an experienced management team. The founder is Jeff Chatfield. He's also one of the major shareholders of the company. It's very important that you understand that uh, this board and senior management of this company own somewhere between 21 and 22% of the equity of the company. Uh, we're only 25 people. We've got uh, the admin cost last year was about $10 million. So there's not huge salaries paid out in this company. That admin cost is everything. That's our office, our salaries, all our travel, our marketing, regulatory costs, admin, everything. So we're aligned with investors because we're all shareholders in the company. 
and, and, we're, and, and it all, it's all meaningful shareholders to us. So we're perfectly aligned with uh, investors. So we go to work each day thinking about how to improve the company, improve the result, and that'll lead to a, an increase in share price. That we've got the, those 25 people have um, uh, years of experience in the business. We've built up a, a platform that knows how to buy and sell planes, write leases, repossess planes if we have to, and got the full set of um, experience um, to run a leasing company. So the snapshot of the company, as I said, uh, due to the delivery last week, we're at 45 aircraft in 17, with 17 different customers. And the split of aircraft uh, in the company is that we have about, um, we do about a third of our, our book is in um, turboprop aircraft. Um, they're small aircraft, 70 seaters. Uh, and about 70% of our book is in uh, jets. Now the reason uh, I'm telling you that is that the evolutionary history of the company is that about seven years ago, the, the, there was a company making event in that the airline that this company was set up to support, uh, which was run by Jeff Chatfield, the founder, was bought by Virgin Australia. And Virgin Australia asked this company, asked Ovation, to supply it with a dozen turboprops. And we, we ran a competition between the two leading turboprops, that's the Bombardier product and the um, uh, Airbus product, which is called an ATR-72. The ATR-72 won because it uses less fuel and we supplied those dozen aircraft to uh, Virgin Australia. So seven or eight years ago, the turboprops were our biggest investment. And that's why it was, I, I mentioned it as a company making event. And, and, and what happened at that point in time was that ATR approached Ovation and said, look, these 70 seat turboprops, which are used all around the world, we only make 75 of them a year. So your order for 12 was a big deal for us and it's obviously a big deal for you. But the big lessors that do what you do out there, they're worried about dealing with the 17 or 1800 jets out there that are worth $200 billion a year in, 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 in capital expenditure. So they're trying to lease those. The turboprop industry is only $2 billion a year. So the jet industry is 100 times larger. So they said, we'll align ourselves with you, we'll give you a unique selling proposition in that we'll give you forward orders and forward delivery slots for these turboprops and then you can go and market yourself to the airlines of the world. Now the beauty of the, getting those forward delivery slots is the ATR has been manufactured for 30 years. It operates in 100 different countries by 200 different airlines. So we, had, we suddenly had a reason to go and introduce ourselves and do business with all of those uh, airlines around the world. And that's what we did. And for the last seven or, seven or so years, We've been doing four or five of those ATR turboprops a year. And we've learned how to do the business. We've learned all the airlines in the business. We've um, done business with them. We've done repeat business with them. We've, we've um, built our credibility in the industry. We effectively became a big fish in that small pond of turboprops. So naturally what we did uh, about five or six years ago is started focusing on the bigger market of jets. And now jets represent 70% of our fleet. And of course, why did we do that? Why did we jump into the narrow bodies, which you know, this type of stuff that Ryanair and EasyJet use, to the, even the wide bodies, the biggest types of aircraft? It's really just to, to enhance that growth opportunity and to enable us to service all the airlines of the world with the types of aircraft that they like, whether they be small, medium, or, or the large size. So we've effectively evolved the operation over the last five years to be able to deliver whatever the airlines around the world want. And that's the, one of the key reasons why I say the growth opportunity in this company is enhanced because it's only in the last couple of years we've started focusing on the jets. It's less than 18 months ago that we actually bought wide bodies, the biggest stuff. So it's that opportunity that, that has enhanced our, our ability to grow into the future. And of course, now that we've moved on to 17 customers, we all, what we hope to do is upsell to our existing customers and doubling the number of customers means that you know, as they grow their fleets, as their fleets age and need replacement, you know, that's opportunity for us to move forward and, and, and grow the company even further. So what we have right now is a very young fleet. As I said, with uh, the current run rate as we speak, um, we're collecting about $11 million a month in rent. Uh, with the growth that we've got coming, uh, by the end of June, it would be closer to $12 million a month. Now keep in mind that if you look at the analyst reports, and if you look at our half year result, we expect to probably in, in revenue to 30 June 2019, just under $120 million revenue. 
Now, if our run rate at that time is going to be just under $12 million a year, uh, $12 million a month, gives you that foreshadows what we're going to earn for the financial year 2020. And this is the important, you know, right now I'm going to talk about exactly why to buy the shares right now. What people don't seem to understand, what we've seen historically in our share price is that when we buy planes, we get revenue from day one. But of course, with a 30 June year end, we're going to deliver, we delivered one of these 10 days ago. We're going to deliver one of these in the next week or so and another and one of these in the next couple of weeks as well. Now, we're almost into June. So those planes are virtually going to deliver no revenue to financial year 2019. But of course, they're going to deliver a full year's revenue for, uh, for 2020. And the four planes that we've already delivered since Christmas uh, you know, only generated revenue for a small proportion of 2019. So that's where the big revenue uplift. And what we've seen in our share price is that the, the, the market tends to wait for us to report that big uplift in numbers before the share price rises. So our message, my message to you as people who either own the stock or have never even heard of the stock is that the, we're going through one of the biggest growth spurts in the history of the company between Christmas and 30 June. Those aircraft will not generate that much revenue for 2019, but will drive the big uplift to 2020. And so you buy the shares now when we're buying aircraft, expect to hold them for a year and let us deliver that um, uplift in revenue. It's really as simple as that. So right now we've got probably, we're gonna end the year with about $1.3 um, billion worth of um, at total assets. And that's just aircraft and, and cash. The, un the unearned contracted revenue is the, co is the least revenue that we are going to earn over the next 7.6 years. That's revenue that will effectively pay off the planes. That number is equivalent to what our, the debt is on the planes. And that is that rule of thumb that I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk that says a plane should pay itself off in its, you know, inside the first lease. That actually applies to the whole fleet. Over the next 7.6 years, we are going to collect $900 million, and that's effectively what the net debt in the company is. So the rent pays off the planes. And, and think about it, think about it from, an, an, from an alternative viewpoint. If you, could find a, if you could buy a flat anywhere in London for a million pounds, and it, it would generate you 120,000 pounds a year in rent, would you buy that flat? you'd buy every single one you could find. Because at that sort of yield, you know, they'd pay themselves off in 10 years and you'd keep buying them and keep buying them and become very, very wealthy. That's the sort of returns that this business generates. So I s the reason why I say that we grow with conviction is that what I've provided here is three year snapshots of the company's operating history. So you see the fleet doubling every three years. If it's better represented if you look at this chart on the, in, in the presentation that you have. You see from 2012-2015, the total assets more than double. And then that happens again to 2018. That trajectory remains on, on, on song. And that's in fact what our objective is today. I sit here today having been with this company for over six years and having seen it quadruple in size, saying that the objective today is to double the size of the fleet again. And this shows you how quickly we can do it. You see that the revenues are directly correlated to the total assets. So as we increase the, the fleet assets, which is what we're doing now with the deliveries that we're, we're delivered since Christmas. So again, I say we've already delivered four planes since Christmas. We've got a couple to go before 30 June, and we've got a run rate into early next year as well. So that growth trajectory is, is on, is, as I said, one of the biggest growth spurts in the history of the company is happening now. And yet we've managed to keep the fleet very young and the, and the, and the, lease return, and the lease term, uh, remaining lease term long. So our main, uh, the, the reason why I, 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 I'm trying to explain the, um, that growth in revenue and that growth spurt is we had a very similar growth spurt to 31 December 2017 where we increased the fleet by about 35%. So a year later to 31 December 2018 when, the, all, when those planes had a year of revenue to deliver, we had a 40% year-on-year year growth in revenue. And then the share price went up. So my question is, you should have been buying shares back a year ago when we were delivering those planes. 
and you would have got the benefit of that uplift. And that's the message that we're trying to get across to investors is that don't wait for us to report the result. You know when the planes are delivered, they're generating revenue. That's the time when you should be buying the shares. So that led to a 60% increase in profit. We, uh, we doubled our total profit after tax and earnings per share. So 2019 is going to be a great year. You know, we're only halfway, well, we're almost all the way through it now. So we're going to release great results in September. But I'm saying don't buy the shares for September. Buy the, the shares for the following September when the growth that we've got right now happening delivers revenue and earnings. Uh, we, we also pay a dividend in this company. So we, uh, pay, it's a progressive dividend. Historic, historically, it's yielded about uh, 2%. Last year, we paid 7.5 US cents for the year. We actually paid an interim dividend already for this financial year of 2 cents. So we're going to pay a second interim dividend. And we expect that to be, uh, we expect at this stage to be progressive. So it'll be you know, above five and a half cents for the remainder of this financial year to incre increase that dividend. So it does yield approximately 2% because while the, while the dividend's been going, the share price has been going up. So the yield has remained about 2%. But as I said, you buy this stock because it's a growth stock. So what have we done this year? We've uh, delivered. Um, well, we delivered, well, this is since uh, 1 July though, remember. So I've talked about the four deliveries since Christmas. We delivered three before that. Um, we've got a couple more to go with the Garuda and the Cebu planes. Uh, we also, uh, sold, we've also sold a plane in our fleet. And as we sort of approach 50 aircraft, you'll expect us to sell um, one or two aircraft a year. And that's positive for shareholders as, as it proves a couple of things. One, it uh, delivers, it shows that the assets that we have are liquid. And two, it shows them that they're fairly valued. And in fact, the plane that we sold in December, we made a, a, a huge gain on it, over $5 million gain. The, the, the aircraft in our book, which I'll, I'll explain a little bit later, was valued just under $50 million, and we sold it for, um, it, at, at book value, we sold it for $54 million, $54 million uh, representing over 10% gain, over $5.5 million gain on sale. So that means the realizable value of the fleet is actually above the book value of the, um, uh, uh, that's reported in the balance sheet. So we've got some more of these unique, the, this unique selling proposition of options for the ATR-72. We've increased the number of airlines. We've repaid some expensive senior debt, uh, expensive senior debt. and um, we um, have um, got a couple of ratings upgrades as well. So let's talk about the industry in this business, which is, uh, this will help uh, you understand exactly why the returns on this business are so high because you should be sitting there wondering how can you generate such how can you generate such high yields off these assets? How can these assets generate 12% when real estate might only generate two or three percent yield a year? And it's fundamental supply and demand, and the supply comes from the duopoly of Boeing and Airbus, who represent 99% of production of all commercial passenger aircraft. It's as simple as that. If you look at their 20 year history, they've struggled to increase production rates at about 5% a year. The demand for an aircraft on the other hand is, growth in, is passenger growth. And last year that was 6.5%. Um, this year it's forecast to be 6%. And if you look at the average over the last 50 years, it's been double global GDP. And that's because you've had the creation of hundreds of millions of middle class, not only you, what we've seen in China over the last 10 or 20 years, uh, but all through Asia. You've got growth in the Western countries as well. You've got the millennial um, issue in that, you know, while the millennials aren't necessarily buying houses or cars, they're, quite, they're taking twice as many um, aircraft trips as the generation before them. And so, what has happened in the last 20 years is that the airlines have commoditized air travel. Air travel is no longer a luxury item. You know, you, we all know that we can buy a ticket for 20 pounds and, with an airline and fly just about anywhere in, in Europe. Now, obviously airlines want to sell tickets for more than that, but they've worked out the business model to enable them to fill planes. That's what airlines have done really successfully over the last 20 years. And if you probably over, in the last 15 years, load factors, and that's just bums on seats, had gone, have gone from the mid 60s, and British Airways was famous for flying one in every three seats empty. Now British Airways has 83% load factor. That's 83% bum. So that's how much more efficient airlines, have. and you know this yourself when you go catch a plane, you never get an empty seat next to you anymore, do you? You know, airline, air, airports are full, queues are long. 
and airplanes are full, which means that any time there is any growth, any time there's a new route, they need new equipment. If they need new equipment, every second plane in the world is leased. And in fact, off the production line today, um, look, last year I think 63% of Airbus's production was financed by lessors. You've got to remember that 20 years ago only one in eight aircraft was leased. So the airline industry is increasingly turning to lessors as a form of financing to acquire new aircraft. So we're becoming the norm rather than the exception. And with, air, and with, and with the aircraft full, routes growing, um, economic growth, the, cre the, the constant creation of middle classes, uh, of new middle class people, especially, especially in Asia, you're getting this new demand for aircraft. And, and because there is a limited supply and there's no substitution for Boeing or Airbus, that's why we generate such high returns in this business. There's no, and that's the fundamental reason to invest in this sector there is, and, and in this company. Because those returns are guaranteed by that demand supply disequilibrium. And what we have is that if you look at both Boeing and Airbus's uh, predictions over the next 30 years, and historically, the, the global fleet has doubled every 15 years. And they expect that to occur again, which means there's going to be lots of business for us to do in the future, which means that growth opportunity that I talked to you about is still there. The biggest companies that do what we do, which are, the biggest one is GE, the biggest pure play listed company is a company called Aircat, which is um, listed in the US. It's similar as AER, if you want to look it up. They both have 14 or 1500 planes. They have $40 billion worth of aircraft. We, as I said at the this, at this earlier slide, we've got less, we're approaching one and a half billion. That's how much opportunity there is for us to grow because, as I said, there are $200 billion worth of new aircraft produced every year. And that's what will lead to a doubling of the fleet again over the next sort of 15 years. And, this, and this, what this also shows is some of the shocks that have hit uh, the, the airline industry. Everything from terrorist events like 9-11, health scares like Ebola and SARS, to financial events like the Asian debt crisis and the GFC. Airline growth in passenger numbers has been constant throughout that. So none of those things has put passengers off travelling. And in fact, if we're looking to opportunities of economic prosperity, that's when people take more holidays and do more business travel. So if you have a bit of a positive outlook into the near future, you know, that growth is going to accelerate. So this is what our current fleet looks like now. And this is how it's evolved over the last sort of couple of years. As I said, the company making event was our heavy investment in the turboprop. So seven years ago, uh, we had about 80% turboprop. And as we started uh, investing more in the narrow body space, and then last year into the wide body space, the jets make up about 70% of, uh, of, our, of our balance sheet. What we have is we've still got the unique selling proposition in forward uh, options and delivery slots for these aircraft. and that's those 12 orders will be placed over the next three or four years. So on average, that means a financial commitment for us for three, three planes a year for the next four years, which is not a big financial commitment. The difference between us and the other big, the big lessors that I just mentioned is that they've got orders for hundreds of jets, which, is, which are, requires billions of dollars of capital to be raised. So in December, when the equity markets turned up on their heads and, and shut down, um, the share price of those companies went down because investors realised that they had to raise money in the future and that equity and debt markets aren't necessarily always open. Whereas our company, without that forward order commitment, hasn't been impacted by that and it's not impacted by that. You know, that's the, 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 the investment of three of those ATRs a year, as I mentioned, they're $20 million, uh, $20 million aircraft. So three a year is $60 million. And because we leverage them, that means we only have to put in $15 million of equity. This is a company that makes over $20 million a year in profit. So we aren't held back by that commitment, even though it does represent growth and a unique selling proposition. The other, how we've bought our jets, because you, you buy aircraft three different ways. One, you order from the manufacturer, which is this way. And the other way is you can buy from airlines when they do sale and leaseback. So you, you'll hear from the Farnborough Air Show that um, Ryanair orders 50 jets. 
they won't necessarily pay for those jets. They'll go to the lessors and say, we'll do a sale and lease back to you. And the other way, the other way that happens is that, as I mentioned, those big lessors like GE and Aircap, when they win the 20 plane order with British Airways or Ryanair, they sell down some of their exposure, sell, sell down some of their concentration because then they've got too much exposure to one airline. And we're natural buyers of that. So we've bought from the big lessors. It's one of the reasons we've got a, it's one of the reasons why we can grow. It's because we can buy planes off them. So that diversification of aircraft type also helps mitigate the risk of overinvestment in one particular aircraft type. So it lowers the risk of the portfolio. So this migration and, and diversification lowers risk in the platform. And so hopefully, I've, from what I've said already, you understand why the growth opportunity is still there for this company. One, we've expanded the types of aircraft that we can buy. And, in, and obviously, these start at $20 million, these at 50, and these at 100. So we can buy, not only are we buy more stuff, but the stuff we're buying is more valuable. So that's why we can invest more. That's why the growth opportunity is enhanced. And we've got a, as I said, we've doubled our number of customers in the past three years. Um, what we've done is also um, keep, kept these um, lease metrics very low. Uh, so we've, that's, we're sticking to the core business model of buying uh, very young or new stuff and putting it on long leases. And as I said, we doubled the number of customers and this is what the customer list looks like today. So there's a bunch of names here, household names that you'll know here. And we'll, currently we generate about a third of our revenue from Europe, a third from Asia and a third from the, uh, from the Australia Pacific region. And these, so this customer diversification is key to mitigating the key risk of airline going bankrupt. We've had, in our 13 year operating history, we've actually had uh, to repossess aircraft twice. Because not only do we see ourselves as bes are we bespoke investors with very strict investment criteria, they're able to pick you know, that eight or nine or seven, eight or nine, 10 aircraft a year. But we also have to be asset managers. We have to go and protect our assets when we need to. And in the two instances where we've had to repossess aircraft, we've made a profit both times. And why have we done that? The reason we've done that is because these aircraft types that I mentioned here are the most popular commercial passenger aircraft on the planet. All of these aircraft types, with the exception of the brand new uh, Airbus A220, have been in manufacture for 20 years. There's just over a thousand of them flying. They're you know, flying all over the world for over 20 years. So you know their liquidity, you know their residual values, you know all the airlines that use them. So if you have to repossess an aircraft, you've got a choice. You can either sell that to the aircraft to somebody or you can redeploy it to an airline to generate uh, rent off it again. If you're dealing in the most popular and liquid types of aircraft, that makes that job very, very easy. And it's equivalent to having that really good flat on the high street that everybody wants to live at overlooking the park. You know, you know that if your tenant leaves, you'll be able to replace that tenant really, really quickly. And that's just how we, how we run our business day to day because all we do, you've got to understand with a leasing company, with 45 aircraft, all we do is collect 45 rent checks a month. We don't do the maintenance. The airline does that. We don't pay for insurance. The airline does that. We don't supply pilots or fuel. We just collect that rent check a month. That's all we do. So operationally, the business is very easy to run. So what we spend most of our time doing is thinking about how to mitigate risk in the business. And we mitigate risk by, if we buy plane, buy plane, if we um, get rent in US dollars, which is typical, we'll get debt in US dollars. You know, we can get, if we can get rent in Euro, we'll get debt in Euro. If we get a 10 year lease, we'll get a 10 year bit of debt. 97% of all the debt in this company is at fixed interest rates. Because we've got, because, because of that long lease term, seven point, we're take, you know, we don't want to take risk on what the interest rate's going to be in 7.6 years, so we fix 97% of our debt. And obviously if we were all on floating rates, the company would make a lot more profit because floating interest rates are lower. So we're, we're quite happy to make the profits that we're making and not take the risk. So not only are we diversifying, not only are we growing, um, the, the, the credit ratings agencies are, are reflecting that in credit rating upgrades, so they think, they're less, uh, they think that they're, we're less risky. So hopefully that answers the second part of that question that I posed at the beginning. One, the growth opportunity is still there. One, because we can do more stuff to more airlines. But is the platform less risky? Well, 
it is less risky and this slide shows it because this is the migration and, and revenue concentration over the last three and a half years. So this is the company is at 31 December 2015. We're collecting about $5 million rent per month. We only had half a dozen customers and Virgin Australia was the majority of that. Move forward three and a half years, we've more than doubled the number of customers. We've grown around Virgin who represent less than a quarter and that percentage is shrinking with every new plane we deliver and every new customer we add into this wedge. That fundamentally proves that the platform is far less risky than it was three years ago. So if the growth opportunity is still there and the platform is less, less risky, fundamentally it's a better investment today than it was three years ago. If you bought three years ago, you would have doubled your money. That's why I say the company's worth investing in now because that growth opportunity is being executed on right now and it's delivered on a lower risk platform. So this is us adding assets. The simplest slide, but they're always the most powerful. Back in 2011, this company had $168 million of aircraft. We're going to finish 30 June with close to $1.3 billion in aircraft. And you see the aircraft doubling in size, you know, every three, the fleet doubling in size every three years. And if you overlay the share price on this, it's highly correlated. So as we add fleet, the share price rises, and that's what we're doing right now. So this is a skill set of the company. This is us being able to, over 13 years, learning how to buy, sell, uh, lease aircraft, repossess them. It's really just a, a statement of our skill set and a, uh, of our people. And this is the final slide which I'll, which I'll finish up upon. We've got a immediate short-term growth, not only to 30 June but into early next year. That'll give an uplift to the revenue in, in financial year 2020. We've, the industry is doing extremely well. While there is distress in individual airlines, as an industry we're, we're talking about five years of record profits for airlines. And airlines have become far more efficient because they've filled aircraft, they've run their businesses better, um, they, they've used technology to sell um, tickets. You know, I can remember when I lived in, in London 20 years ago going down the high street and buying a paper ticket. And if you lost that paper ticket, you know, what were your chances of or try to change that flight. Now you can pick up your phone, buy a ticket, you can fly out of London in about four, four or five hours time. You know, that's fantastic use of technology. And they're gathering data to build new routes and, and demographics on who they're selling to. That's why airlines are doing much better than they ever have. You've got to give them credit for that. They are filling their planes. Um, we've got very young fleet with long lease terms. We're diversifying not only our airline customers, but aircraft type, and that lowers risk. We're, as we get a better credit rating, we're lowering our cost of debt, which improves profitability for the future and, and actually enhances our um, competitiveness in the future and our growth opportunity in the future. As we evolve into being a big lessor, as we continue to grow, we'll evolve our debt capital structure, get a better credit rating, lower our cost of debt. And when we lower our cost of debt, we'll be able to compete with the big lessors on price. And that means going after the 10 or 20 planes with Ryanair and EasyJet. That's who we hope to be in four or five years' time. That's why the growth opportunity actually st stays with the company. As long as we lower our cost of debt, which we've done every year, we become more competitive. And that means we can, if we can compete on price, we'll compete with the big lessors. And finally, I, what I mentioned, and I'll just finish up on, is that we sold one aircraft during the year. And the aircraft that we sold was an Airbus A321. We have seven of them, we had eight, we sold one in December. That aircraft represents about a third of our total balance sheet investment. So a third of our fleet is represented by A321s. That plane was $48.7 million in the balance sheet. We sold it for $54 million, we made over $5 million gain. What does that tell you as the investor? Well, the reason why you invest, as I said, was because of the growth. But what helps you sleep well at night is you know that the fleet is, has a realizable value above the book value. And the stock is trading around book value today. So if we just sold everything, we'd return more than the current £2.93 share price to investors today. But that's not our goal. Our, our goal is to double the fleet again. And we'll, you know, if we do that, we'll double the revenues and the share price will follow. And that's all I've really got to say about Ovation. I'm happy to take your questions from here. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much.
Oh, all right. Can I ask a question about your growth? So you have like a, a billion in down sheet uh, today. Or yeah. A little over a billion. You yeah. Asked, you're saying that you're going to double that over the next two years or so. Uh, well, historically, we've doubled every three years. Right, every three years. So um, we're assuming that if you want to add a billion, you get 80% LTV, like you said, yep. you can. Uh, where does the uh, like 200 million or 250? Uh, from in equity come from, yeah. Some yeah. Some what, this, what, what, this is a, it's a great question actually because what we historically what the company does is make about $20 million, last year made $20 million in profit. So that's new equity added on. Um, but what it also does, because I said two thirds of its debt stack, or two thirds of the debt that we have in the business is senior amortizing debt. So I, I mentioned that we collect 45 rent, check, rent, check, rent checks a month. We also make 45 mortgage payments a month. And last year we paid off somewhere between 50 and $60 million in senior debt on top of the $20 million of profit that we earn. So that's how we generate equity. And this is how the business model actually really works in real life. We buy, we find a plane and we lease it to an airline for 10 or 12 years. We put debt against that. So th say it's a typical plane like this which is a $50 million aircraft. We'll put in $10 million and borrow 40. Now, we'll be able to amortize that 40 to zero you know, over that 12 year lease term. And so that aircraft is owned outright at that point in time. Now, it's depreciated. We depreciate over 25 years to scrap value. So that's 3.4% a year. So 12 years depreciation at 3.4%. That plane's worth in the book about $30 million, but it's owned outright after year 12. Now, what, the, what happens in 19 out of 20 times in our, in our experience over our 13 year history is that an airline will extend the lease on that aircraft for five or seven years. And we'll give them a discount on the rent because it's an older plane and it's you know, dep effectively depreciated. So we still get our 12% returns because it's off a dep lower depreciated value. But we have a $30 million asset that all of a sudden has a new five or seven year lease contract attached to it. So what do we do? We remortgage the plane. We release the equity. And, you know, and a bank will happily give us $20 million for a $30 million plane. Guess what? That helps us buy two brand new planes. There's the $10 million each. For, and that's all we've done for, th for 13 years. It's exactly like paying down your mortgage, re remortgaging your house, and then buying an, that flat to let. And then building your property portfolio that way. That's all. The, that's the, how this business runs. It's, as, it's really as simple as that. And once you understand that, you understand exactly how we run the company. So that's where the equity comes. You release equity by remortgaging, or uh, if a plane is obviously old and unencumbered, you sell it, and, and so that's you can get a leverage return off the equity on that. Hi. Yeah. So mine is actually pretty much the same question. Um, you look like you, so just a moment you expand on a little bit. It looks like you're putting on about a billion assets yeah. by fiscal by year 21, um, which is going to need about another 220 million of equity. Yeah. You're putting about 30 million of equity a year from yeah. your income statement into your balance sheet. Yeah. How about you paying dividends? Yep. So I'm seeing a shortfall of equity hitting your balance sheet over that three year period. Yeah. So I hear what you're saying about um, the difference between depreciation, but I, I'm, I guess I'm still a little bit confused about how you're going to hit 500 million or 40 yeah. of equity yeah. at the end of 21. Well, what I'm primarily talking about is, you know, the, the, historically the co company's doubled every three years. Our objective today is to double the size of the company again. Whether we can achieve that in three years or four years, like I don't know. As I said, the, the prime equity comes from, um, you know, paying down, you know, 50 or $60 million in senior debt every year. Um, and that, you know, that's, um, you know, that's far in excess of the depreciation rate. And along with the equity that we produce um, and the planes that we've got, so you know, as of today, we've got nine unencumbered planes on the balance sheet. So that's all planes that don't have any leverage on them at all. So we're sitting there with actual financial flexibility at the moment. So we've got um, spare capacity to gr to grow. And and you've got to remember that because we, um, the board and senior management, own you know 22 percent of the company. If you look at our five-year history, our, our, our growth rate. And this is the best way to sort of prove that statement. If you look at our growth rate, which has been over 30% a year for the last half dozen years, we've barely issued any new equity. 
And so we've been able to self or organically generate equity all along. Now, of course, if there is an EPS enhancing opportunity for us to grow, you know, buy half a dozen planes from a big lessor, well, we'd present that to the market. But that's not the objective. The objective is to, you know, grow the company, grow it cautiously and with leverage constraint as we've, as we've done for 13 years. I think we've got a track record that shows that. So what we've never done is issue lots of equity for any, any particular reason. So we've been able to deliver that growth rate by keeping to that core business model because it generates enough equity for us to grow. Um, exactly what that trajectory is, it really depends because even, a, even with a billion or approaching a billion and a half dollars worth of stuff, you know, some of these acquisitions still look quite lumpy. You know, a hundred million dollar plane is a lumpy acquisition. You start buying two or three planes at once, um, it, you know, these metrics move around a little bit. But, you know, we've been, uh, we've been able to generate so much um, equity organically, it's never been an issue for us. And we're, you know, because we own so much of the company, we're, you know, we're quite stingy with our, with our equity. We, we, we're kind of looking after ourselves as well as, as, well as you, the investor. Thanks. Um, just one more question. Uh, do you have a target um, for ROE that you try and uh, no, because it, it, does, it does change and move around a bit. What we're sort of seeing, as you see with the growth, um, perhaps the best way to demonstrate it is if you think about the two key expenses in the business. The first is interest expense, obviously, because this is a leveraged business. You've got our cost of debt coming down. Our last reported cost of debt to 31 December was 4.9%. That's going to come down again to 30 June. Um, that makes a significant impact on the, on, the, on the return on equity. And then, of course, you've got the economies of scale. You know, we've doubled the company in the last three years. And I think three years ago, we had maybe 19, 20 people. Today, we've got about 24, 25. Um, so you're seeing that we're able to, we're, we're getting to critical mass in staff. We're able to double the balance sheet without doubling, you know, the staff. So we're seeing real economies of scale and we've seen Admin as a function of revenue come from 15% down to 9%. So I do see that coming down even further as we continue to grow. So we, we, we do see ROE enhancement through those economies of scale and through the um, evolution of the debt capital structure and lowering of the, of the, debt ca um, uh, lowering of the cost of debt. So we see that really just being enhanced, but we haven't got a target on it, a, a particular target on it. Is there any other questions? What aircraft tax do you, you think you'll be mainly investing in in the next uh, couple of years? But yeah. I see you going towards the, the big lessors, the uh, 737 world, and you and I know at least for it's not one percent a month in that world. Yeah, look, what we've seen is um, there is there's in, in the narrow body space, narrow bodies, you know, the, the Ryanair and EasyJet planes that we're all familiar with represent three in every four planes on the planet. There is a lot of competition to, uh, from all the big lessors in this space um, and lease rates are relatively low. We are still bespoke investors, so we are able to find good opportunities um, that, um, that we're happy to invest in that um, not only diversify but credit enhance our fleet. The 737 that I mentioned that we're buying, you know, that's, a, that's a plane that we um, signed up, uh, uh, it's a second hand plane. You are, we, we've all heard about the 737 MAX issues. This is the older version. Um, so this plane we agreed to sell before, the, we agreed to buy before the second crash even. Uh, the price was set at that point in time. Uh, it's with, it's uh, leased to Garuda. Garuda have since cancelled their MAX order and advised that they're going to extend leases on all their 737-800s. So that's the type of individual aircraft investment that's still material to us, but the bigger lessors probably wouldn't bother with. But it's, a, it's credit enhancing to us, it's a new aircraft diversification, um, new customer, all of these things. And it's the right aircraft, you know, 737-800s and actually all the A320 family have all gone up in value and up in lease rate since the problems with the 737 MAX. And we don't have any exposure to the 737 MAX, not in the current fleet or anything that we're looking at in the future. So that's, you know, that's us being bespoke investors. That's us applying our strict investment criteria. As I said, we invest in the most popular types of aircraft. And as I said during a speech, each one of these aircraft has been in manufacture for over 20 years in one version or another. So it's a proven type, it's a popular type, it's spread out with airlines all over the world. The only new technology aircraft we've invested in is the Airbus A220, which was the old Bombardier product that Airbus um, took majority ownership of last year. And that was really the, the sort of 
the condition for our investment in that aircraft type. We felt that it needed Airbus's um, sales network and support. And Airbus now have over 400 orders for that aircraft, guaranteeing its future success. And that aircraft's a great aircraft. We, we know that from, you know, from, the, from the fuel burn rate and the efficiency, and it's been in operation for over two years. So we're happy to take an investment in an aircraft like that. It reminds me quite, uh, quite similarly to the ATR that we, we invested in you know, seven or eight years ago, in that it was really class leading, really fuel efficient, uh, and had a real opportunity. It might not suit every route, and, and you've got to remember, you know, ATRs are mission specific, route specific. They're only really good for five or 600 nautical miles, but they're in wide usage. You know, this aircraft you know, doesn't, you know, has got a, quite a, a strong range, but not as a bigger range as some of the other stuff. But what we're seeing, the airlines who use it are able to build um, really good low cost carriers because of their, their operating costs are uh, extremely low if they use that aircraft. So it gives them a great chance of success. So we think that that aircraft will be successful, which is why we've taken that investment. But that's the type of aircraft that we like. We want to see it in wide usage, lots of orders, lots of uh, spread out in lots of geographies. And then we know that if any particular airline goes bad, you know, we can go repossess our aircraft and put it to and deploy it somewhere else. Hi, Richard. Uh Perhaps you can just say a little bit more about your thought process when you decide to make a sale like the, the A321 at the end of last year. Is, is it sort of shorter term balancing the books where yeah. you can see you yeah. can buying planes in the near future or is yeah. it something to do with a, a good bid coming on that asset in 54 million? Yeah, it's, it's, it's actually all of those things. We, you know, we look at with that aircraft, we had six with Vietjet. Vietjet was our second biggest customer. It was actually higher than 15% there. We thought we had too much concentration. We, uh, when we look at the A321, it was, a, it was over a third of our balance sheet in investment in one aircraft type. So again, probably too much concentration. Um, we had um, you know, five identical ones with Vietjet. So we, it, we felt that it would help prove liquidity to investors. Uh, and we felt that um, we knew there was huge appetite for um, that sort of that narrow body. You know, we were our history with Vietjet was that you know three years ago we we leased a couple of planes to them, and this is when they were more an up and coming airline. And then you know they we did we did great business with them. They gave us another four or five aircraft, which we did. And now now you look three years later, Vietjet's made continuous profits. It's had credit enhancement, IPO'd in the Vietnamese stock market. Um, really performing well. And now the big lessors are in there trying to do 10 and 20 plane deals. So we're an early mover in there. So all of those factors contributed to the value enhancement of that particular aircraft type and that particular aircraft. So, you know, we sell to reduce concentration, to release equity, um, to lower risk and to prove liquidity as well. And, and, you know, we made a great profit along the way. So as, as we're about to approach 50 aircraft in the fleet, I, you should expect as an investor to see, a, to see us sell one or two aircraft a year. Not only to prove liquidity, but because we do have ageing aircraft and we need to release equity. You know, as I said, we've got some aircraft that are unencumbered on the balance sheet now. So we generate a better ROE if we sell that and use that plane to buy, say, two more that are leveraged up. So that, that's a part of the thought process as well. And in terms of your <coughs> portfolio of airline plants, is there a region you particularly like to expand or is there market brand uh, airlines that are very much on your target list? And I presume that the US is, is kind of out of reach whilst there are the monster lessons like GE out there. Well, the, the US airlines are also actively participate in the debt market. So they issue bonds and, can, and buy their own aircraft. And there's also, you need to take into account with the US, is you've got chapter 11 protection um, when airlines go bad. So you might, may, may, may not be necessarily able to access your aircraft. So that, those are the things that sort of restrict us from there. Look, we, we're concerned about regions like South America and, and um, uh, Russia, we don't have any exposure to China, although the big Chinese airlines are fantastic. Um, you know, we, we sort of look at all the, juris all the issues when we, when we make our investment criteria. Um, we are, we really do see ourselves as looking at for those one, two and three plane deals, you know, which is not in direct competition with the big lessors. And we see, you know, hundreds of opportunities like that a year for us. So that's more where we're playing. Uh, as, you know, as we are able to look, there are often, you know, look, how did we get EasyJet? We got EasyJet 
because we bought an aircraft that was on lease to Air Berlin. Now, that aircraft that was on lease, Air Berlin was never a great credit, but we knew that in the event of default, which actually happened in August 2017, Lufthansa and EasyJet would be fighting over its routes. And so when that aircraft went, uh, when that airline went bankrupt, you know, within 48 hours, we were talking to both Lufthansa and EasyJet. And we, and we ended up with EasyJet, as a, which is one of the best airlines on our list. So, you know, we, we look for opportunities like that, that, you know, necessarily the big lessors don't. You know, that's the, the Garuda plane is a similar style of investment thesis, where we look at one plane that makes, uh, uh, is, a, is a positive for our book that may not necessarily change the, the broader portfolio, but is a great fit for our, for our fleet. Thank you. Um, I know um, as a, um, an SE, higher for 16 doesn't impact you, but what about your customers? Does that change the aircraft leasing market at all? No, we haven't seen any real change in terms of, you're talking about um, the airlines having to report leases on their balance sheet, the liability of leases. What's happened is that they've all had to do it at all the same, you know, at exactly the same time. So all the analysts just review all the numbers at exactly the same moment. So we haven't seen any immediate change in, in financing or demand for financing from any of the airlines. It's in effect, in effect a global implication of it and so it hasn't really sort of impacted leasing, lease rates or, or demand for leasing or financing at all. Okay. How, is that how, sen how sensitive is the business model to your tax residency in Singapore? And if the aircraft leasing scheme is to vanish overnight, yeah. what impact would that have on yield? And is there a plan B? Yeah. Because protectionism is on the rise at the moment. Yeah, sure. Well, I th well there's, there's three common places that you domicile aircraft leasing companies. It's Singapore, Hong Kong, and, and Ireland. Uh, of the one that's probably at greatest risk is Ireland because it's at risk from the EU. Um, the Singapore Aircraft Leasing Scheme, we've been a member of for five years. We actually got, um, it, we actually, they renewed that five-year uh, membership two months ago. So that's in place, set in place for the next five years. They actually lowered the corporate tax rate from 10% to 8%, and you got that withholding tax exemption. Look, we look at that's it, that's that's with the you know the Singaporean government. So we th we think that's relatively low risk compared to say Ireland, um, Hong Kong have got a similar scheme, um, which um, you know we sort of think that's a uh, that'd be a viable plan B for us as well. There are other places that you can domicile aircraft leasing companies as well, but you know, look, this is a very profitable business. Any any real profitable business wants to be in a low low tax regime, and you look for those sovereign nations that do protect it, like Singapore. I think they're natural harbours for, for for these sorts of businesses. Any more questions? Thanks. Thank you.